Um, we have we, this is an organization organized by Ian Forum Center of ICOL. So we have people joining us from Italy, US, and all part of the world. And we have our uh, chairperson, Mataya Krum. She's heading our ICOL Young Professional Group. And we have a lot of people from Italy, India as well. Looking forward for your session. Thank you. Uh, Amit. Yes, sir. Uh, since uh, we have Michelle Lino with us, so uh, I would request Mr. Lino to please uh, uh, say a few words on this occasion and address the young professional group. So, Michelle Lino, Honorable President for uh, the High Court, and not Honorable, he is the present president. We, I am using word Honorable because he is respectable for the High Court group. <laughs> so I request Michelle Lino to kindly start with his address. OK, I thank you very much, uh, Davandra, and uh, I try to to share my screen. Yes, please. Yes. Tell me when uh, when you can see my screen. You can see. You can see. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. OK. So good morning from Galway, Ireland, where I am presently and good afternoon to you in India. I, I suppose most of you are in India, but I saw that not all of you are in India. So I'm Michel Lino from France and the new elected uh, president of ICOL. I am very pleased to have been given the opportunity to speak to you uh, by my dear friend uh, Davendra Sharma, president of INCOLD and vice president of ICOL. We have known each other for many years and have de developed a very nice relationship, I think. This webinar is organized by the Young Professional Forum of INCOLD, and I am delighted to see so many young professionals more and more involved in our DAM community. I would like to begin by congratulating INCOLD Young Professional Forum on selecting the theme I do climatology implications on dam safety for this webinar. Indeed, it is a very important and critical topic. I also like to congratulate Dr. Tigavara Rupu, Tiva, sorry, Tigavara Rupu for its major contribution to this webinar. Yeah, uh, as uh, you all know, dam safety has, play, uh, has been a core value of ICOL since its foundation in Paris in 1928. In 2019, ICOL issued a World Declaration on Dam Safety. In response to this, the Indian Parliament recently passed the Dam Safety Act 2021 for dam safety governance in India to ensure the safety of the existing and the future projects. Sorry, uh, Sandeep, yes. The declaration identifies climate change as one of the changing conditions of dam safety management. Climate change causes changes in extreme precipitation and drought events, resulting in increased hydrological risk. It is critical to consider changes in climate during planning and management including resilient design and adaptive reservoir operation of dams. Yes. Um, let me let me begin with a striking example 
of the problem we face. In January 2022, the cyclone Anna struck Madagascar, Malawi, and Mozambique. The Capitula Dam in Malawi, th th there, is, uh, th there is an echo, I don't know. There is a big echo, I don't know where, where is it? I would request everyone to please mute their mics so that it is done in a proper manner. Is it okay? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So let me begin with a striking example of the problem we face. In January 2022, the cyclone Anna struck Madagascar, Mozambique, and Malawi. The Capitula Dam in Malawi was severely damaged and the 130 megawatt power plant was put out of service for months. The emergency spillway fuse plug was flooded and washed away. You can see on the picture uh, an aerial view of the Capitula Dam. You see the dam and you see the river and the, the, the bridge there in, this, in that place. There was a fuse plug, uh, an embankment fuse plug that was washed away by, by, by the float. Before the event, water was flowing on the left bank to the to the power intake there. Now, after the breaching of the fuse plug, the water is going directly on the right bank in its initial and uh, historical channel. And there is no more, uh, no more water in the, in the power plant, no longer. Fortunately, there was no human life losses but the economical impact is catastrophic because Capitula power plant represents 30% of the installed capacity, electric capacity of the country. I am currently working with the World Bank to prepare an emergency plan to restore power generation as soon as possible. This last slide shows the I called Young Professional Forum board during the roundtable at the recent I called Congress in Marseille on the theme Dams and Reservoirs, the challenges for tomorrow. You, young professionals, are the future, and your actions will shape your lives and those of your children. It is a great responsibility, and I am confident that you can raise, rise to that challenge. And now, I wish you a very fruitful webinar. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Michel Lino for your very thoughtful address and insight into the Malawi, Malawi power plant. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you I very much. I hand it over to Amit Gautam. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, so I would uh, now invite uh, DK Sharma, sir, who is the vice president I called and president in call to say a few words before we start with the presentation. So over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Amit. My job has been made very easy by President Michel Lino. He has very nicely covered about the young professionals and about the emergencies we uh, have been having because of the climatic events. See, like, I would like to add here, like, first of all, let me say that Michel Lino is the such a great force and has been guiding us throughout in, in cold, whenever we required his help, he's always ready. 
and uh, i also would like to thank uh, dr ramesh tiga varupu for agreeing to address this uh, topic on hydro climatological implications on dam safety uh, well i would like to add something here see dam safety as you are aware in india we have passed the dam safety act 2021 and we have formulated the dam safety committees uh, at the central level and at the state level and first meeting of the national dam safety committee is scheduled to be held on 28th of this month so we are hoping that uh, uh, so far as country is concerned we will formulate the guidelines for the entire country how we should proceed ahead with the dam safety uh, i would also like to add here see the as uh, uh, president michel lino told just now climate change is something which is affecting all of us and in india if you look at it Uh, this is just the beginning of the monsoon and all the rivers in the western part of india are <coughs> in spate there are floods almost in um, i think 20% of the indian territory and uh, we we have so huge impact that most of these dams which were empty before the monsoon uh, though they don't have very large capacity but almost all these dams including the sardar sarovar dam they are filled up up to the top yesterday i was having discussions with the secretary and the director of the sardar sarovar dam and he said they are having difficult time in controlling the floods and if you can see that throughout the country there are on television almost for full day we have these scenes where you have the people rescuing the national disaster management force rescuing the people throughout the day so that is 24 hour that's their job so the climatic change impacts these extreme events are becoming more and more frequent and we need to work on it and dam safety is one area where it is going to affect us the most because ultimately what happen they think the dam should control the flood but most of these dams having small capacity reservoirs cannot really control the flood these dams having have, many dams have so small capacity even a dam having 1 billion cubic meter of capacity during the monsoon cannot really control floods that is my experience when i was heading one of the <coughs> like organization topmost organization dealing with the dams in this country so it is what what is important is because you have dual purpose you need to store water for non monsoon period but at the same time you need to ensure that there are no floods so these high magnitude extreme events are so large that uh, they can fill your reservoir having large capacity in no time so i i'm sure that the young professionals would uh, learn uh, to with through uh, the through the lecture of dr ramesh today and uh, i wish the young professional forum good luck and i also compliment amit gautam and his team for taking this initiative for organizing the event and in cold is all the time we encourage our young professionals because we see them as the future for uh, the entire dam community in the world and especially in india we have uh, encourage them at each step and in cold has been helping them to uh, come forward and we last year only we formulated the young professional forum in india and uh, i'm sure that under leadership of the mr amit gautam they will do a great job and i wish them good luck thank you thank you sir motivation comes from people like seeing people like you and michelle lena you know? uh, with your permission and president's permission i would like to formally start this i mean uh, if uh, if uh, to start this webinar uh, is since most of us join us so uh, good morning and good afternoon to all of our participant present across the world My name is Amit Gautam. I'm chair for Indian Committee on Large Dam Young Professional Group, and I'm also on board with I Cold YPG. I today I along with Julia from Italy will moderate the webinar. So let's get started. Uh, uh, just for the introduction of all, uh, we have been joined by President I Cold, Honorable President Mr. Lino, and uh, Vice President I Cold and President in Cold Mr. D K Sharma. Our honored guest speaker, Professor Ramesh from Florida, has joined us. 
uh, all along with our board member of ICOL YPG. I welcome you all. Uh, uh, it is a moment of extreme pleasure, in fact, for me to welcome you all and convey my and I convey my regards on behalf of Encol. I would also like to extend my greetings to all the young professionals who have joined us today and the guests who are here to attend this webinar. Just a little housekeeping, sir, before we get started. You would all uh, you would all agree that climate change change and dam safety has almost become a synonymous to each other, and it becomes extremely important, as pointed out by you and President as well. Uh, I'm sure this session with Professor Ramesh today will enlighten enlighten us all and provide us with the approaches to deal with the problems of today and tomorrow. But before we get ahead with him, we have lined up three small, very special presentations with you all. Where first, Ms. Mathea, who is the chairperson for iCold YPG, will be sharing about iCold activities, how we help each other grow, how we help each other learn and be a better person, and how you, and most importantly, how you all can be part of it. Then it will be followed by Mr. Adarsh, who is from Encold YPG. He'll be briefing us about the evolution and prospects of TAM safety in India. It will be followed by Ms. Ludvika's presentation. She's a representative from Italy. She'll be sharing Italian experience on tackling, clim uh, tackling climate change challenges in dam management. Uh, just a little reminder before I hand over this stage to the speakers. Uh, at any moment, if you feel asking any question, drop your questions in the message box. We'll be taking all the questions in the dedicated session at the end of the presentation. With this, I would like to welcome you all once again, and uh, let's celebrate dams. I would like to invite uh, Ms. Mathea to have a, a presentation. Mathea, can you please share your screen? Amit, thank you for the introduction. And yeah. yes. I would like to say welcome to all of you attending this webinar. I'm very pleased that we started a new season of the webinar. Now, let me see if something is strangely happening. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, it's visible. Yes, there. perfect. Okay. So my presentation is devoted to brief you on the activities of the young uh, engineers forum and its role within the ICO. And I will start by acknowledging our history. We just celebrated 10 years of our activities during the last meeting in Marseille. And here I would just like to acknowledge all the previous chairs of the Young Professional Network Forum since they did an amazing job by keeping this group alive and starting it. Um, the main vision and mission of the ICOL Young Professionals Forum is to target professionals in their early careers. We are especially targeting, targeting professionals in the STEM and hydropower sections, both engineering as well as science, and we are trying to provide opportunities for networking. We are trying to provide opportunities for knowledge transfer. And we are doing our best to bridge, bridge the gap between the generations. At the same time, we are also trying to inspire young professionals to be active, to be active in their national committees, to be active in the ICO technical committees. And of course, we are also encouraging for more national professional networks to form and join us. I will like to mention all board members. Uh, it's seven of us, and this is the current situation after the elections in Marseille. So on the board, we have Gabriela Molindo from Sweden, Julia Buffy from Italy, Amit Kautan from India, Wilbur Forsman Irakiza from Uganda, Tim Ivanov from Russia, Florent Bakus from France, and me, Matea Knun. Uh, from Slovenia as the current chair. Uh, the typical term of office of the board members is two years. Elections happen during the ICOS meeting. So during the next meeting in Gothenburg in 2023, two, two positions will open. Uh, we will post more about the nomination for this position a few months before the event. 
but we prefer to be geographically as diverse as possible so that every region is represented in the board. Uh, and we allow only one uh, country member to be on the board. So, of course, uh, that member has to have um, support from its national committee. Uh, by now, 27 ICOS member countries have formed Young Professional or Young Engineer Forum. And since there are more than 100 ICOS member countries, we are encouraging also those countries who haven't formed Young Professional Network that they do so and that they can join us. And if you need any support on how to do this, you can contact us and we will provide support that you need. The main events that we are targeting, of course, are all ICOS events, the main one being annual meetings. So as I mentioned, the next one will be in 2023 in season Gothenburg. We will continue with the virtual events, with online meetings and webinars. Uh, and we will continue with the network activities. Our main network platform is LinkedIn Group. If you're not part of it, please join. Uh, I will show you the link on the next slide. And we are also updating the national list of the national young professionals. And we are aiming to include national representatives in our work as well, for example, to co-host webinars like this one today. So I'm only mentioning that this is only the first in the series of the webinars. There will be more to come until the next annual meeting. And I must say that all these webinars are recorded and they can be accessed online. So all the three previous webinars can be accessed on these three links that you see over here, or by browsing to our LinkedIn group or going to our YouTube channel. And the same will be with this webinar as well. We will publish it and it will be accessible online. And on that note, I would just like to extend our invitation to get involved. Uh, you can try to reach us via LinkedIn. Also, you can use the chat today and reach us about how to get involved. You can use the general board email or you can contact any of the us board members. Uh, we will get back to you and we will try to find uh, what you need from us. And with that note, I would just like to say enjoy the rest of the webinar. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Matea, for your crisp and brief presentation. It was uh, lightning and enlightens us a lot. A lot. Uh, with this, uh, we'll move ahead. And I would like to invite Julia to take ahead the presentations and webinar ahead. And I'll see you at the end of in Q and A session. Thank you. So thank Over you, to Amit. you, Julia. Yeah. Thank you, Amit. Uh, well, good afternoon. Good morning, uh, standing on uh, the place so you are. And uh, I am uh, Julia Buffy, uh, a member of the uh, I called the EF board. Uh, well, I come from Italy and uh, I, I am glad to be part of the events. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank you to Amit to um, to be part of uh, telematic co-host of these events. Uh, well, I, I, I am a structural engineer and uh, I work for a public company uh, who provides drinkable water in Italy. Uh, and um, today um, I will present the relator of the uh, more technical part of the events. Uh, therefore, uh, let's start. And uh, the next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Uh, Adarsh uh, MS. And um, um, he um, joined the Central Water Commission in uh, July 2015. He took his uh, uh, master at uh, the Indian Institute of Technology uh, in Kampur in uh, Structural Engineers. Currently, he is working as a deputy director in uh, Heidel Civil Design Director of the Central Water Commission. And uh, he's involved in the construction project, uh, such as uh, uh, Punanshu uh, first and second uh, in Bhutan. Therefore, 
Dr. Uh, Adarsh, the floor is your. Thank you, Julia, for the kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning to all members and to our seniors as well. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I'll just share my presentation. I hope it is visible now. Yes, it okay. is. OK, thank you. Uh, so I'll be speaking about uh, the a little bit about the overview of evolution and uh, future prospects of dam safety and its management in India. I will be in a short time and I would try my best to make it useful for you. Uh, so let's start with the uh, status of dams in India. Uh, currently, we have about 5,348 large dams which are completed and about 397 large dams which are under construction. And if we look at the worldwide perspective, we stand at number three after China and USA with the large, uh, uh, in the large number of uh, dams which are made. And uh, in these dams, we have a total storage capacity of about 257 billion cubic meter and another 51 billion cubic meter of storage will be added using the under construction project. And if you can see it, this uh, 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 plot, this is a plot of the large dams which are being constructed in the uh, last century. You can see about uh, the most of the dam projects were constructed between 1970 and 1990. So currently we have about 80 percentage of the dams which are more than 25 years old and about 227 dams which are more than 100 years old. And when we take a scenario of about 2050, in these dams about 4,264 of these large dams would have been aged by at least 50 years. In among these, 64 would have already crossed 150 years and 301 would have crossed between 100 and 3,874 large dams would be anywhere between 50 to 100 years old. And uh, in the, uh, we have till now about 41 dam failures reported in our country. Majority of them being earthen dams and most uh, the major cause of failure, which can be uh, the overtopping or uh, the breaching of uh, the dams. Uh, so let's uh, taking that into consideration. I'll just go into the just a brief into the need for dam safety. As you all know, the dams are a very costly infrastructure, infrastructure, and they take a mammoth effort to build. And also there is a lot of uh, investment going into these uh, infrastructures. They are considered as critical assets for water security and considering the changing climate usage and uh, uh, the age of these dams, these can pose as a hazard if they are not managed properly, particularly when they are linked to public safety and has also a role to play as a benefit assurance schemes. Further, if they are not uh, managed properly, these can also cause interstate and international ramifications. And in India, currently we do not have any uniform practice which is being followed across the states uh, for managing their dams. So keeping this uh, per into perspective, let's see a first a case study why this dam safety uh, is required. So I'll bring your attention to a, a case which happened in last uh, November, which is Annamaya Dam, which is located in the southern part of India. I'll just list a few points in the salient features because these are uh, useful later. So this is located in the southern part of India called Penar Basin. This is divided into two parts, the upper basin and the lower basin. In the lower basin, the, uh, uh, the dam is located, the Annamaya Dam is located here in the Cheyu River. And there is an upstream co dam called Pinchar Dam. And this dam has a FRL of about 203.60. And there are five radial gates provided, which can have a maximum spillway capacity of 2,60,000, QSEX. So what happened for this dam to breach was in uh, last year, 18th to 19th November, there was a, a high amount of rainfall which happened in the catchment of these dams. And based on the available forecasts which were available, the project authorities reduced the level of water level from uh, 203.6 to 201.6. 40 at the morning of 18 when the uh, initial flows were around 9800 QZX only. Gradually, the uh, due to the increased rainfall, the uh, uh, amount of uh, inflow started to rise to about 42,000 QZX in the evening of 18. However, in the later part of the night, there was a sudden increase of inflow to about 320,000 QZX, which came into the Annamaya Reservoir due to a, a failure of a, bund, a ring bund in this Pinchar Dam around 3,20,000 QSEX of water came into Anamaya Dam. 
at that time there were five gates which were provided in uh, annamaya dam which had a over total capacity of 217000 however they could only open about four gates which had a capacity of 146000 one of these gates was non functional due to a cyclone which happened in the previous year which was nivar cyclone in the previous year november it happened and eventually the frl was touched at the early hours of 19, 19th november and at about 5 am the dam overtopped by about 1 meter and the earthen part of the dam got completely eroded you can also see that the uh, concrete part of the uh, spillway was intact however the earthen part was completely eroded and this is the cross section of the sea now uh, from this we'll see what what were the dam safety evolution which happened in india over the past the first dam safety organization was started in cwc in 1979 after one of a Machu Dam which failed in uh, Gujarat in uh, the year 1979. And later we established a National Committee on Dam Safety, which was established in 1987, to act as a think tank for to deliberate upon policy and guidelines, which we can be implemented across the nation. And later we had foreign assistance coming from the UN, which uh, ran a program for assistance from UNDP, which uh, ran from 1987 to 1989, where a center and the state governments participated in it. In a uh, later part, from uh, the World Bank came into picture, where they started a program called Dam Assurance and Rehabilitation Project from 1991 to 1999. This program was continued by World Bank in an another name called Dam Rehabilitation and Improvement Project called RIP. This started in 2012 and has been going on uh, now and it will run to 2000, uh, 2030. During this period itself, because these uh, guidelines and policies were not statutorily mandated uh, to be done by the dam owners, it was thought that uh, uh, a legislative backing should be there for uh, this uh, policy and guidelines. So accordingly, a model bill was introduced in the parliament for first time in 2010. And after much deliberation between different committees, different states, and um, it was finally passed in 2021 in December, and the dam bill was enacted into a dam safety act. Now, we'll, uh, so currently in India, these uh, projects are running: the drip project and the dam safety act. I'll slightly uh, detail about these uh, these two things. So, the dam rehabilitation improvement project is run by World Bank with a primary agenda to improve the safety and operational performance of selected dams, and provide institutional strengthening with system-wide management approach. This is particularly done by the state governments or the dam owners, but overall supervised by the Central Water Commission at the national level. The major agenda can be seen that to address the challenge of aging water sector in perspective with the changing climate. And this uh, state center can also act as a model for, uh, model for cooperation between the center and state. It also promotes the institutional strengthening and also brings in self-reliance for water security and knowledge. And uh, it aims to promote a sustainable dam safety culture. So uh, from uh, DRIP, uh, the World Bank, the first program was Dam Safety Assurance and Rehabilitation Project, which ran from 1991 to 99. 182 dams were covered at a budget outlay of $86 million. And in DRIP phase two, the dam rehabilitation improvement uh, project phase one, between 2012 to 2021, we had 233 dams with a budget outlay of $533 million. This was completed in 2021 and World Bank has given it a satisfactory uh, completion criteria. In phase two and phase three, which is currently going on, it will run from 2021 to 2031. We will be covering about 763 dams all over India and uh, it has a budget outlay of uh, 1418 million dollars so the drip is done in three components particularly the first is the rehabilitation of dam that there if any spillway addition or any uh, changes in uh, structural intervention or non structural in in interventions are required they will be covered in rehabilitation of that and uh, specific trainings or educational programs are done for to maintain the institutional strengthening and an overall project management is also done to, Im uh, to impart a, a dam safe culture into the uh, system. So this is what happened in trip. So I'll just talk a, a few more about the Dam Safety Act, which is currently the hot topic in India. It came into force from 13th December 2021. It has a pan India application 
and the uh, major part is that it provides for a proper surveillance, inspection, operation and maintenance of specified dams for prevention of dam failure related to disasters and to provide an institutional mechanism to ensure their safe function. So these specified dams are either large dams or any other dams which are specified as per a particular criteria. I'm not going into much detail of this Dam Safety Act, but because it's very lengthy one, and I'll just go next to the institutional uh, culture of which is being uh, envisaged for this uh, Dam Safety Act. So this is basically a two tier structure, one at the national level and one at the state level. At each level, there would be a consultative body and also there will be an implementation body. At the uh, national level, we have National Committee on Dam Safety, which will act as a think tank for evolving the dam safety policies and protocol, which can be ensured across the nation. It is a like uh, an overall an overview policy, like how we should be going ahead, not specific to a particular dam. And uh, this uh, uh, think tank would be supplemented by an, a national dam safety authority which is a regulatory body for implementing policy and uh, guidelines. They have statutory backing uh, to implement these guidelines and there are certain offenses and penalty clauses all which are also kept into these acts. And coming at the state level, state at the state level, there is a state committee on dam safety, which has to be uh, constituted by the state governments for so that they can manage the uh, dams within their states in sync with the decisions which are taken at the national level. So they are at, at a state level that a state committee on dam safety will monitor and their implementing agency is a state dam safety organization, which is uh, interested with to carry out the inspection, surveillance and monitor or operation and maintenance of each of their dams, which is uh, which is with them. They either do it on with themselves or uh, they have to enforce it at the dam on this because in some states, some of the dams are not owned directly by the states, but by uh, some uh, public sector undertaking. So they will be an indirect agency in that. So in the current status, uh, the, as our uh, chairman has uh, said, uh, pres vice president has uh, already mentioned, these uh, national level committees are already made and their first uh, meeting would be held shortly. One workshop was also held where to sensitize the state governments safety and uh, the currently the state level uh, uh, committees and organization are under uh, uh, under being uh, formed and we are actively pursuing with the states so that they may be formed at the earliest so with this uh, i would like to conclude my presentation and i'll uh, thank you for your attention and i go let's go for the next thank you Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Adarsh. Uh, thank you for giving us uh, this overview on uh, the dam landscape on, uh, on, of India. So uh, we move uh, uh, to the next speaker. She is uh, Ludovica Ruggeri. Ludovica, probably she is uh, the only one to be pronounced well by me because of uh, she is Italian. Uh, she works for Enel Green Power, a global renewable electricity generation company, uh, where she works uh, as a hydrologist in the hydropower business line, in particular in the dam safety team. Uh, she's currently the coordinator of the It Called Young Professional Forum. Therefore, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Julia, for your presentation and uh, good afternoon, good morning uh, to everybody. Yeah, this is uh, exactly lunchtime, so <laughs> I, um, I try to be quite quick uh, and uh, let me share my screen. Let me know if you see that. Yes, we can. Yeah. See, okay, uh, so uh, I'm Ludovica Ruggeri and first of all, let me say thanks to um, uh, Ankoli uh, Young Professional for organizing this event, which is a great pleasure and a great honor um, to be able to participate. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, climate change challenges in dam management uh, in, uh, in Italy. I will start with a brief overview on Italian large dams, and then I will move on climate change evaluation, impacts evaluation, and I will conclude to discuss some possible action to implement. 
In Italy, we have uh, 530 large dams with a total storage greater than uh, 10,000 million for cubic meter. The main use of Italian dams is for hydropower, uh, almost the 60 of the of 60 percent of the total, and secondly for irrigation. Instead, the distribution of water storage use is reversed, with the major storage allocated to irrigation and then to to wider power. Moving on the main impacts uh, of climate change on dams, they are identified uh, for Italian reality uh, as follows. First, the water availability in terms of sedimentation, irrigation need, water supply to need, uh, and the possible arising of conflict between uh, different stakeholders. Second, uh, the dam safety um, in terms of uh, thermal loading and uh, changing, physical loading changing. Third, include um, in fluid control in terms of fluid risk, fluid design and emergency planning assessment. And last but not the least, uh, to industrial use in particular on hydropower generation. To quantify these impacts, climate change indices come uh, to our hide. Uh, they could be classified uh, in the main drivers and in climate extremes indices. In the first class, uh, we find the mean temperature and the total amount of precipitation. Uh, in the second class, uh, we can find the four indices that I'm listing you. Uh, first, uh, CDD, so the maximum number of consecutive days, let me say, without precipitation. Then SDII, so the sample, uh, the, se the simple precipitation intensity index. Then R95P, so the annual total precipitation in the very wet day. And uh, finally, uh, RX one day, so the maximum one day precipitation. In this chart, you can see the indices anomaly since the reference period in case we do nothing uh, to reduce emission in atmosphere. Focusing on uh, the last row, last row of the maps, which reports the result for 2061-2090 period, we can observe an increasing on the mean temperature and decreasing of annual precipitation. Instead, regarding the stream indices, we can observe an increasing of all of them, especially in uh, CDD and R95P indicators. In the next two slides, we can see the main evidence if, uh, related to the results shown before. Uh, uh, so a temperature increasing, a total of mount precipitation decreasing, and a maximum number of consecutive days without rain increasing may suggest an increase in drought severity and decrease in water availability. This can lead to upgrade the water storage need estimation, especially for agriculture and, uh, and water supply, and a planning how to satisfy them. Uh, and uh, furthermore, uh, also to define a new plan to regulate water use uh, to avoid the, the arising of uh, conflict. Instead, um, maximum daily precipitation increasing, a precipitation in very wet day increasing, and uh, a precipitation intensity increasing related to a decreasing of total amount of precipitation may suggest a growth of extreme events, in particular of fluid. This could require um, a discharge design and fluid control procedure assessment and eventually a redefinition of uh, the emergency plan. So uh, I, I tell you that we, I be uh, very quick <laughs> to conclude we can state that uh, climate, climate change could impact especially in terms of fluid and water scarcity. Most of dam operators uh, in Italy are evaluating the climate change impacts uh, at their dam site as for the, um, the business core. Our uh, assessment of future irrigation and drinking water needs should be carried out uh, and also uh, how to um, uh, satisfy these, these new needs. 
and uh, also our, uh, our assessment of dam safety and fluid design uh, should be carried out uh, in order to evaluate uh, the dam safety to uh, extreme uh, events. So uh, this is all. Uh, thank you for attention and leave you with this uh, last chart that is uh, our Young Professional Forum in, uh, in Italy and uh, where you can find uh, us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ludovica, for uh, giving us uh, this overview on uh, climate change uh, index and uh, scenarios uh, in Italy. And uh, now we are moving to the central part of the events. Therefore, I would, I would like to present uh, Dr. Ramesh. Uh, he works uh, in the Department of Civil and Environmental Geometrics at Florida Atlantic University uh, in uh, Boca Raton uh, in uh, Florida and he is the founder and the leader of the Hydrosystem Research Laboratory in the department. Uh, he is a Fulbright scholar and specialist. He is also an affiliate researcher with the Freight Mobility Research Institute. Uh, he has uh, over 20 years of experience in uh, hydrological modeling and water resources system area. He was previously a member of a climate change working group and the current chair of climate change adoption committee of International Association of Hydro Environmental Research. Uh, he has uh, published uh, over uh, 130 uh, technical papers uh, on um, high impact factor papers and uh, conference proceedings. And uh, he is a tour uh, of moreover um, 20 books uh, chapters. Uh, he is uh, author or co-author of more than uh, 50 technical reports. Uh, so, uh, he reviewed uh, more than uh, 80 international papers and uh, 50 international conferences. So, um, Dr. Ramesh, um, uh, current research interests focus on climate variability and uh, change, precipitation process, water and environmental system modeling, and extreme pre pre precipitation events, spatial interpolation and geospatial methods, radar meteor meteorology, rain radar relationships. So uh, thank you to be here, Dr. Ramesh, and the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself. You're on mute. Oh, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Grazie, Giulia. Um, <laughs> let me... Prego. <laughs> um, uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to all uh, from different parts of the world. Let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, so let's see if I can. OK, thank you so much uh, for uh, this opportunity. I'm really uh, thankful to uh, Viraj uh, Loliano from FAMS who initiated the invitation. Uh, I'd like to thank INCOLD, ICOLD, uh, Young Professional Forum members and all the members who are here uh, who have um, definitely more experience than me in, in dam safety. Um, uh, uh, compared to my experiences in reservoir operations and uh, looking at how we can change the operations under uh, evolving climate. So my presentation will focus on hydroclimatological implications on uh, dam safety under evolving climate. And, uh, and the, uh, as you can see that uh, I'm going to focus on what are the major risks to uh, dams and reservoir operations under climate, uh, evolving climate. Uh, what are the implications of changes in hydro, hydrological cycle? How that is going to affect our uh, design of dams and operation of reservoirs in future? Uh, dam safety issues, definitely there are different types of scenarios. One is the, um, uh, the, the scenario which, uh, which results in uh, what we call the hydrological scenario and the non-hydrological scenario. And all types of stresses on how 
uh, the functional operations of dams are affected, starting from water supply, hydropower, and flood, flood control, and uh, some recent dam failure case studies, uh, just to give you a glimpse of uh, how this whole dam safety discussion has become more important these days uh, concerning the climate change. So if you see the current headlines, you see that uh, there are a number of headlines related to dams, uh, especially the, the way the hydropower um, is decreasing in terms of uh, the impending doubts in different parts of the United States. And we also see some dam failures, which are threatened by climate change, uh, extreme precipitation events. Um, mostly uh, these dams were affected by uh, huge uh, precipitation events or some other factors which are related to the upstream watersheds. So you can see that there is more emphasis on uh, looking at how we can uh, how we can address the issue of climate change, uh, especially when dam failures are apparent and also which threatens to the future of the renewable hydropower. We're also asking questions, is hydropower, considering the evolving uh, climate change uh, question, is that really renewable? And uh, can we do something about that? Of course, there are a lot of challenges concerning hydropower, um, and I have worked on hydropower for a long time. Uh, and then, of course, there is also issues with how uh, dams are polluting. There is one group of uh, environmental conservationists and so on uh, complaining about large dams, which uh, their uh, fears are understandable. Uh, sometimes uh, dams do pollute. Uh, they do produce methane. Uh, and of course, um, the, the extent of methane they say was not captured rightly because we were not measuring it correctly um, uh, in the dam uniformly or uh, spatially within the reservoir systems and so on. Uh, of course, there is a, some issue with respect to uh, methane production from the dams. We take it very seriously. Um, and then, of course, the, the other side, which also talks about the problems with large dams. We, we acknowledge them. We know that large dams have some issues uh, which uh, both are environmentally um, uh, conscious uh, people will oppose. And we also see that some damage is being done, displacement of the human beings and so on. Uh, the greenhouse gases, especially the methane emissions, are also not that significant, but still uh, to be considered considering the amount of dams uh, we are constructing and the large dams we already have. So obviously there is some um, um, uh, opposition to large dams. But of course, dams also provide some advantage in terms of how um, they provide the renewable sources of power and water supply, uh, flood control, environmental concerns, and so on. But at the same time, recent studies have also proven that by storing enough water in the dams, we are able to uh, limit the sea level rise. This is an interesting uh, study. This was done. And of course, uh, uh, the, the good contribution of the dams in trying to store that water and reduce the sea level rise is a welcome uh, research result. So if you see for the um, for the uh, the functions of the dams, uh, this uh, we know that they help and reduce the spatial and temporal variability of the water supply. Uh, they provide reliable sources of water. Uh, they have definitely sometimes undesirable impacts and they are very controversial, both socially and politically as uh, water secre security issues. That is very important when uh, uh, dams are constructed. Uh, they are capital intensive uh, investments. Um, dams are also now being uh, studied uh, from a perspective of how they are going to change the regional and the continental hydrology. And they also see that we have multiple objectives for any reservoir, and therefore we are looking at how we can operate them considering uh, flood control, recreation, and environmental concerns, ecological concerns, and so on. And then, of course, the major uh, uh, water supply and flood risk management objectives are definitely uh, sometimes opposing um, to each other. 
We all know that we use all our dams and reservoirs for uh, irrigation, navigation, water supply, recreation, and I call them functions of these dams, and these are very important. So the very fact that the climate is evolving is going to affect every single part of these functional uses of the dams, and we have to be extremely careful in how we address this problem going into the future. So just a few definitions, uh, for example, uh, there's reservoir and dam are used synonymously, uh, but there's a slight difference between them. For example, reservoir indicates water that is being impounded by the water, by the, by the dam. And dam is that the actual structure, the artificial barrier uh, made up of concrete and so on that helps us to impound the water. So basically that small distinction is uh, very critical. Um, so there can be professionals working purely on a structural parts of the dam. Uh, there can be uh, professionals working in uh, reservoir operations. And uh, the two definitions, the PMP and PMF. Of course, the definition of PMP is changing uh, as we speak. Uh, this is the theoretically the greatest depth of precipitation that is possible based on the hydrometeorological conditions at any given location at any time of the year. So this is the PMF, which is sorry, PMP, which is being used um, for our design. And then we use this PMP to drive our uh, uh, flood models, and then we come up with what we call the PMP, the probable uh, PM, PMF, sorry, the probable maximum flood. Uh, we do have rule curves. Uh, you must be all familiar with that. These are the curves which are provided based on the historical operations of the uh, reservoirs. We also have optimization methods which can help us to define what should be our rule curves if we are maintaining uh, the reservoirs or managing the reservoirs for uh, flood control or water supply or irrigation or environmental concerns and so on. Uh, these are not, uh, these are supposed to be rigid, but nowadays they are becoming more flexible. So now we are looking at what we call uh, sustainable operating rule curves or climate change sensitive rule curves so that we can start looking into the natural functions of a river body without a reservoir. So in the sense that maybe we can try to uh, look into restore the streams, restore the, uh, the habitat in the streams, restore the ecological conditions of the streams, and also at the same time augment the flows with in a river so that you can still have a reservoir, you can still manage uh, the system, but still in a more sustainable manner. So the focus now is more on the sustainable operation of reservoirs as opposed to um, just uh, looking at a couple of the objectives, what we they are meant for. Now, we, these days we are focusing on the risk. As you will see in my presentation, that risk has become an important component of the dam safety. So we are looking at what are the drivers of risk. And then typically a risk is a product of occurrence of a specific event and the consequence. Uh, the consequence can be um, uh, both direct or indirect. So we use that information to come up with uh, the concept of uh, risk. And based on that, we can manage um, the risk. Of course, it needs assessment in the first part. Then we go into the management part. So if you see the construction of the uh, dams, uh, this gives us the age of the dams uh, throughout the world. Of course, this figure masks some of the old dams, which are in red color. Uh, but then you see that we still have a lot of young dams, uh, which are started in 1980s, uh, or completed in 1980s, and then um, some of them completed in 2010. We're still constructing some dams. So obviously you can see that there is a mixed bag of uh, the age of the dams uh, throughout the world, which is uh, sometimes um, uh, can be seen positive that we are constructing uh, a good amount of dams for our renewable hydropower, uh, systems, water supply, and rent control, but at the same time, some of the dams are aged, so we need to look into what we can do for that uh, when we are trying to understand dam safety. So this is your uh, distribution of the dams. Um, I think the Indian number is now increased to uh, 5348. These are little old numbers uh, I picked up from ICID, and you can see that India stands uh, at third, um, having a good number of large dams. 
and definitely um, India and other uh, countries which have the largest number of dams, especially top 10, um, should be considering uh, what kind of um, uh, guidelines they should be developing in terms of dam safety and then how they will operate reservoirs, uh, both in short term and long term. Uh, considering both climate change and climate variability aspects. Uh, the, sil the spillway capacities are also uh, listed here, and you can see that uh, India tops in having the largest spillway capacities of the um, uh, dam systems. And you can see that the majority of the single purpose and uh, multi-purpose dams, what is their main uh, uh, objective? For example, irrigation stands to be the, uh, the top, then comes your uh, hydropower, uh, then comes your water supply, and then flood control. Uh, of course, uh, these change based on the different parts of the uh, regions of the world. Uh, here's a distribution of the single purpose, multi purpose, and the type of dams. Uh, of course, uh, you see that uh, the majority are for irrigation, as we have seen. These are just a little pie chart giving you more uh, specific information. As you can see, uh, dams plus climate change is bad news. This is a a small um, uh, booklet published by Earth Center. And you can see that. Uh, we agree to some of them. Uh, the dams can lead to habitat destruction. Uh, sometimes dams were uh, causes for some earthquakes. Um, and then, of course, uh, the consequences due to climate change, they are also exasperate because we are storing large amount of water, uh, the evaporation losses, and then also the greenhouse gases. But then if you look at most recent study in 2022, um, the water security becomes very important. Water security tells us that um, in, in zones where there is uh, a high importance to water security, especially in uh, um, low uh, water security, uh, sorry, low uh, availability of water or dry zones, there is a willingness uh, for, uh, uh, to pay for the dam construction. And of course, they, they, they see the dam benefits and they also have a positive acceptance for the dams. Uh, where in, in cases where the water security concern concerning high, <coughs> high um, uh, wet zones where there's a lot of water availability, uh, the dam impacts are considered higher and then the dam uh, acceptance is uh, lower. And then of course, there is a push for uh, dam demolition. So you can see that this is obviously not counterintuitive, but this was based on a number of surveys and they could uh, try to codify that knowledge uh, in the form of some kind of influence diagrams to show that uh, there is still willingness uh, for people to consider to pay for the dam construction. <clears throat> so uh, considering the climate change and variability impacts, uh, recently we saw the, the release of AR6, uh, the assessment report from IPCC, and uh, which almost follows the similar conclusions what we have seen in the past reports, uh, human influence um, and uh, unequivocal human, uh, human influence on the atmosphere, ocean and land. Um, human induced climate change is also affecting us. Uh, the global surface temperatures will continue to rise. And then, of course, uh, heavy precipitation events um, in different parts of the world. Um, it also is going to affect our uh, water cycle, uh, the global monsoon precipitation, the severity of wet and dry events is going to change uh, in some parts. And then uh, some of them, are the greenhouse gases are uh, irreversible for and then especially in the uh, ocean, ice sheets, and global sea level. <clears throat> um, the natural uh, drivers, for example, the natural climate variability, uh, will also modulate the human cost changes um, at regional scales and near real time, uh, real term. And then uh, with global warming, every region is projected to increasingly experience concurrent and multiple changes in climate impact drivers. So, um, so what we see is that all these extreme precipitation indices going to be affected, including the uh, consecutive dry days, uh, intensities, and then R95s and R90s, and all those indices uh, will have an impact in different parts of the world. 
and you'll also see um, uh, substantial changes in your uh, um, ice sheet collapses, uh, ocean circulation changes, and so on. And then, of course, uh, the uh, discernible effects of greenhouse and aerosol concentrations um, scenarios indicate that uh, there will be a uh, um, there will be an impact on uh, the the climate. Um, under the scenarios of increasing CO2 emissions, the uh, the ocean and land carbon sinks are projected to be less effective at slowing the accumulation. This is a major uh, conclusion. And then many changes to past and future are irreversible, which we have already seen. So uh, typically what we see in uh, uh, climate change models suggesting that uh, the increase in global average annual precipitation in some parts of the world, not necessarily all, um, although changes in precipitation may vary from one region to another region. Uh, natural climate variability may alter the precipitation intensities and storm durations, which would have consequences for hydrologic and hydraulic infrastructure designed under stationary assumption. So most of all hydrologic design, including dam design right now, is based on what we call the stationarity assumption. The stationarity assumption says that the past or the future is reflective of the past. So that is no longer valid because we are seeing that non-stationarity in our essential climatic variables, and we are seeing that uh, the, the climate change effects are seen on our hydrological cycle components. So therefore, non-stationarity is now uh, the important factor that needs to be considered when we are designing our hydraulic and hydrologic structure. So what are we doing in terms of the design practices? We incorporate climate change factors. So if we are not going to use projections, we are going to just use some kind of factors to uh, what we call the fact uh, safety factors and so on. We design our structures. <coughs> or look at the trends in precipitation extremes and then frequencies. Maybe that can help us in improving our design practices um, and evaluating the impacts of changing extremes uh, using downscale precipitation data. For example, if it is a hydrological scenario, you are looking at uh, our hydroclimatological scenario. In that case, we are looking at temperature and so on. So we look at these extremes um, using GCMs, that is uh, general circulation models or global climate models, and then and we design uh, new frameworks uh, considering risk and uncertainty. We need to manage both of them. So, of course, there are uh, lots of uh, technical documents and guidance documents which are uh, starting to evolve in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, every, country, every country is embarked on looking at how climate change is going to affect hydrologic design, how uh, climate change is going to affect our infrastructure, how climate change is going to affect our um, our uh, uh, dam safety and so on. So we started to see this documentation in the last 10 to 15 years. <clears throat> so we all know that when we look at future climate, we are looking at increases in uh, global average surface temperature, frequency and intensity of heat waves and droughts, changes in precipitation intensity, reduced snow cover, widespread melting of ice, and this has resulted in multiple uh, flooding events and failure events of dams. And then <clears throat> the changes in soil moisture and runoff are some of the key documented changes that are often associated with global climate change. So soil moisture is a very important uh, component of your hydrologic simulation that needs to be considered when you are trying to simulate uh, watershed conditions for flooding. Now, these are very important questions we need to ask. Uh, as you can see that these are very well posed questions. Will dams be effective in future as they have been in the past in providing full suite of services that I designed considering evolving climate? This is a very important question. Uh, will the degree of natural flow disturbance by dams change substantially in the future due to operations? And what about consequences of dam removal? and dam building and how do we change the design methodology in considering the non-stationary non-stationary climate so we know that climate is evolving we cannot use the past records to design our dams or um, design our operation schedules we need to look into non-stationarity and then of course if we consider <coughs> sorry <coughs> 
If we consider the evolving climate, will our design lead to cost sustainable options? So that's these are some very important questions. So if you see uh, what is going on right now in different parts of United States, especially the Western United States. Um, you can see the Colorado River. We have multiple uh, dams and then we have seen a considerable reduction in the uh, storage and this has been happening for a long time because of consistent and persistent droughts. And uh, this it has impacts on water supply as well as hydropower. And you can see the aerial images from um, two years, uh, 20 and 2021. And you can see the extent of water. And this is your Lake Mead. Um, and you can see the, the water levels going down uh, due to the historical low. Um, this is the lowest level in uh, 60 years. So obviously that is a big cause for concern. Over 200 feet uh, of water is lost. Even though there are some variations, there are some times where the water level recovered, but uh, in general, we are seeing a very decreasing trend in the water levels in the lakes. Uh, this is Lake Powell, which I showed you initially at the beginning. Uh, and you can see that over the last 20 years, you can see how much amount of water has substantially reduced. <clears throat> and this has impacts on water supply and hydropower. And we continue to monitor the drought. This is the drought monitor picture for today. Uh, I just picked up in the morning and you can see that how different parts of the United States are extremely uh, um, uh, dry or in a condition of extreme droughts. And there are places where there are exceptional droughts also. So this is quite uh, an important uh, condition uh, for us right now. And they're also thinking about rationing uh, water supplies, uh, not using for long lawns and uh, uh, taking less time for showers and so on. And these are some situations which we see in many parts of the world, especially recently I've been in Italy and then you can see in the northern Italy, the Po River is almost dried uh, and you can see the droughts, impending droughts in many parts of uh, Europe and also the heat waves are expected to happen this year, um, which are a 200 year uh, records uh, that will be broken in Europe in the next 15 to 20 days uh, based on some predictions. So looking at some failure modes, uh, these are uh, just for our information and you can see there are a number of ways an embankment dam uh, can fail um, and you can see that uh, cracking, concrete failures, uh, sometimes animal activity and so on uh, that can uh, introduce the failures. Um, but mostly the failures are overtopping, uh, seeping fa uh, seepage failures and structural failures are a combination of that. Now, these failures are important because when we look at the risk models, we, we have to understand that each failure mode has a certain probability. So we need to look into the probabilities of these failure modes so that we can combine them and then try to evaluate the risk associated with them failure of the structure. Now, the consequences, of course, will have to be measured both indirect and direct or estimated for that matter. If you look at the recent failures, um, these are the dams. Um, when I say dams, they are a combination of uh, um, small and large, and uh, you can see dams with hydropower of only 3%, and uh, most of the dams are state regulated dams. We have around 91,984 total dams. Um, the, these can be very small dams, uh, even though the number is very large. Um, and based on the uh, American uh, Safety Dam Safety Association, you can see that, uh, sorry, Association of Dam Safety Officials, you can see that uh, the major cause of the incidents uh, for dam failure in the last uh, almost uh, 10 years uh, from 2010 to 2019 is overtopping. And of course, there are other failures which are uh, associated with the um, piping and spillway failure and erosion and so on. Um, the incident driver, the driver which mainly causes this flooding is hydrologic. And that, of course, is related to flooding. Um, then, of course, there's a seepage and uh, internal erosion, 
and then uh, deterioration and structural stability also come in. But you can see that the main failure driver is hydrologic. So here's an example of a recent failure of uh, a dam in Michigan, and you can see five inches of rain in two days. Um, and one of the important things you need to recognize here is that the earlier storms have saturated the ground that increases the uh, the propensity for higher runoff and flooding and that caused a huge flooding and you can see that the failure of the dam um, and this is what uh, uh, that particular failure has caused the inundation and of course uh, thousands of people have to be evacuated um, the other one is a major story. This is the Oroville Dam in California, uh, a massive failure, a massive hole in the primary spillway, uh, erosion in the emergency spillway, and uh, this is one of the tallest dams in the United States. And uh, this is attributed to what we call atmospheric rivers. This is the phenomena where a tremendous amount of rainfall is um, uh, generated in one particular region, and I'm going to talk about that. And Majority of the uh, researchers believe that climate change is a contributor to this particular failure, especially the hydrological um, driver. And you can see that the amount of precipitation totals in this uh, particular region, um, especially Oroville, you can see that um, uh, how much amount of precipitation fell in the last 90 days before the incident. And uh, this is uh, California, by the way. And how the uh, the historical storage has been, and then the current storage uh, when that incident occurred, and then you can see that how the water quickly rose to the to the high uh, uh, reservoir level that was on February 9, 2017, and then of course there was another event which also happened in 1997, um, but then that didn't cause the failure of the spillway. So this is your uh, typical structure of your dam. You see the spillway, and then you also have an emergency spillway. And uh, this is this gives you a better idea about the dam and the primary spillway. And uh, this is the water flowing on top of the emergency spillway uh, because the water levels were so high. And uh, this is what has happened. Um, the the erosion of the um, the emergency spillway, as well as how the, the particular uh, rainfall event has caused the um, the spillway failure, the amount of water that poured in uh, gave away the ground beneath that, and then we lost a significant amount of the uh, primary spillway. I'm going to show the pictures related to that. So they tried to repair, they tried to put some more. Uh, rocks in trying to repair the, the emergency spillway, especially to reduce the erosion. They tried their best. Um, and you can see this is what the actual picture where, where the water is flowing on top of the main spillway as well as the emergency spillway. And that has the damage that has been done to the, um, uh, uh, the spillway uh, during that particular event. And this is another one, which is the Spencer Dam in Nebraska. This is basically an ice jam related uh, um, uh, flooding event uh, that caused uh, issues, uh, uh, complete failure of the dam. Um, the, the ice jam risk was underestimated um, for this particular dam. Uh, there was a huge report on uh, Spencer Dam failure, and you can see that heavy rain um, falling on top of a uh, frozen river. And then there's also a cyclone which brought in a tremendous amount of uh, rainfall and that caused this uh, breaking of the uh, ice sheets and then which led to the collapse of this particular dam. And that's the damage uh, from a different view. So as you can see that anytime we are talking about uh, dam safety, uh, there are climatic drivers which are purely driven by climate. Uh, then there are non-climatic drivers, the population increase, economic development, and how we adapt to water management uh, in that area. Uh, also, there are different scenarios which are possible. One is the hydrologic scenario. The other one is the non-hydrologic scenario. When I say non-hydrologic scenario, it can be a structural failure due to an earthquake or uh, some other something which is not completely related to a hydrological situation. Sometimes when we look at hydrologic scenarios, what we do is uh, we, we simulate the floods. We, we look at different return periods. 
starting from two years to 10,000 years. Of course, uh, the, the higher the return period, the more uncertain we are about the uh, peak discharges. However, we can always generate these numbers and these numbers can be used for our design purposes. Uh, the classification, uh, the dam safety of, uh, uh, is important, and in that process, we can classify dams as three levels, the high hazard, the significant hazard, and the low hazard, depending upon the, um, the losses. Uh, if there's a human loss and there is a, a failure of a dam, uh, then that will be considered as a high hazard. But then uh, there are other losses um, may not be uh, human uh, uh, loss, then in the, it can be a significant uh, potential hazard. And then there's a low hazard potential for different types of dams. This, of course, is a classification. This is also emerging. This is also changing as we speak. Um, and then, of course, every time we are classifying a particular dam of a particular uh, uh, category, then we have to suggest what type of um, um, what type of um, design floods we need to be using. And some of the guidelines indicate that, OK, you can use a PMF. That is the probable maximum flood, which is generated from a PMP um, in US right now. The PMPs are also being getting revised. Um, the PMPs are also getting revised based on the new type of data which is available. For example, we are looking at radar data for the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, we are also looking at rain gauges. We are also looking at uh, the atmospheric rivers, which I'm going to talk about it a little bit. And so again, the PMP itself, the definition of the PMP, as well as the way the PMP is calculated, is being revised and then so that we will have a better understanding about PMP estimation in future so that we can use it for our design calculations for the dams. So uh, hydroclimatic extremes and Im impacts. So what happens when you have extreme rainfalls? Of course, uh, increased stream flows will happen. Increased pool levels in the reservoirs will happen. Overtopping is a big risk. A residue forces uh, for overtopping flows, in increase in the structural and hydraulic stresses due to additional weight of water. And then stresses will cause potential instability in the dam leading to the failures. And these are, of course, we all know that um, uh, some of the issues associated with extreme rainfalls. Uh, elevated reservoir levels, extreme rainfall events, the, uh, they add the pressure on the seepage path and that penetrates to the foundation. And in that process, you will see some piping and other issues for embankment dams. So if you look at the flood protection, of course, I'm, I'm looking at climate change impacts uh, for different functions um, uh, of the dams. For example, if you are looking at flood protection, then uh, there's increasing flows. We have extreme flooding, overtopping, um, increase in sediment loads also as we get in more water into the system, uh, more sediments come into the system, uh, storage capacity is reduced. Uh, sometimes these sediments will block the spillways. Uh, extreme temperature. Uh, extreme temperature. There can be, there can be, there can, there can be structural stability issues. Um, then increase in vegetation that maybe block uh, the spillways because now we have temperature which is more uh, uh, amicable for increase in the vegetation. Now, if you look at the hydropower generation, uh, especially there is uh, higher end flows and lower end flows. Um, increase in flows will cause extreme flooding, uh, risk of damaging hydropower generation infrastructure. Operation distance will reduce the storage to accommodate the flows, hence lower electri electricity generation is possible. Increased sediment loads will impact your penstocks and turbines, and we'll see power outages. Uh, on the lower end, uh, you will reduce your uh, ability to generate your hydropower, and then this will re require re-evaluation of water allocation for multiple uses of the reservoir, and then, of course, uh, decrease in the water availability for the release because you're trying to store more water into the reservoir so that you can produce hydropower. Um, Extreme temperature in case of hydro hydropower generation. Uh, there are some indirect influences which will drive uh, the hydropower generation when there is extreme uh, temperature, increases in demand for electricity, 
more releases to generate electricity. And the timing of the releases will affect the water availability again. Uh, the water quality, extreme temperatures, if you are looking at uh, extreme temperatures, increase in the receiving water temperatures. So that will lead to thermal pollution and then also affect the aquatic uh, habitat. And then if you are looking at water use for agriculture, drinking water, water quality, extreme precipitations will bring in sediment loads. When they bring in sediment loads, you are looking at water treatment costs, uh, overtopping, downstream pollution risk, and we have to question the suitability of water for use and of course impact on aquatic life. On the lower end, you see reduction in inflows, um, you know, you can, uh, your ability to reduce, sorry, ability to sustain agricultural use will be uh, affected. We we'll have pollution issues, low flow augmentation will suffer, recreation uses are affected, and then of course operations will require reevaluation of how you allocate water. So depending upon the type of the dams, the, the climate change will have impacts. For example, uh, in case of extreme precipitation, more rapid fluctuations will increase the pore pressures and they will rapidly fill um, in advance uh, of the uh, uh, rains, uh, risk of piping failure, mass instability, overtopping, erosion of the dam face if there's a rainfall directly on the embankment, and then increase in the seepage and so on. Uh, in case of uh, other type of embankment dams with the clay core, and you can see that uh, different uh, processes happen for the clay core, and you can see that you are having uh, a different effect because of the climate change, uh, shrinkage of the clay core, and then loss of vegetation, uh, exposure to unprotected sections of the dam, erosion, uh, slumping of the upstream dam, cycles of dry and wet period. Uh, then you, if you are looking at temperature, there's an increased evapotranspiration, uh, increase in desiccation and uh, shrinking of the clay, vegetation growth on the dam face, and we need increased maintenance. Uh, concrete dams, um, you know, sometimes they will have effect based on uh, the higher precipitation when they are combined with wind, the wind action can impact the liners, uh, the exposure of the liner, block tracking, um, and then um, the drying of the asphalt linings on the concrete dams, if at all they are there. And then of course there is uh, temperature variations will introduce cracking and then the performance of the binding mixtures which are used. Um, the, the major events are the overtopping and sliding and overturning, depending upon how much flows coming to you into the into the reservoir system. And then the higher end uh, temperatures will cause uh, different types of, uh, you know, thermal expansion issues, uh, UV damage issues on the joining materials and the binding mixes. Uh, spillways also will have stress because of extreme precipitation events. Uh, the failures can happen and also increase in transportation of the debris. Uh, and this debris starts blocking the spillways and you cannot release effectively. And that is going to cause um, uh, problems with the spillway operations and maintenance and eventually failure of the spillways. Uh, the other types of structures which also are affected by debris and uh, uh, possible cracking of concrete channels, wave walls and any other metal uh, linings or steel linings which you have. So the idea is that climate change information projection models need to be used in designs of dams. We, we have seen the, the consequences of high temperature and high precipitation in different on different types of dams. Now we need to start thinking about how we can introduce climate change into our, our design process. Um, the revision of PMPs, this is very important. We are trying to revise the PMPs. For example, after the failure of Oroville Dam in California, which prompted the design engineers to consider climate change. Um, this is a wake up call for them to see that we are seeing this extreme uh, rainfall events. We need to start thinking about how we can introduce climate change into our operations process also, not only, not only into the design process, but also uh, into the operations process. They call it as forecast informed reservoir operations. And, uh, we also look into the designs which are not purely based on the stationary climate. And then we need to redesign our spillways to handle larger volumes of water for a longer 
time periods. So if you see the, the whole concept of FIRO, that is forecast informed reservoir operations, uh, this was basically started because of the failures of some of the dams, because of inability of some of the dams to handle the extreme amount of water. And there were some blaming uh, going on in, uh, in uh, uh, different parts of the United States talking about why these failures have happened. And these are basically purely due to operational reasons, how the forecasters as well as the managers of reservoirs think to operate. Um, and then sometimes they they may not be able to use the forecast of uh, um, future rainfall and future temperatures and future snow snowpacks, uh, rain on snow or melting of the snow and the timing of the uh, melting as well as the uh, soil moisture conditions in a watershed. All these things are not known uh, to the operators. So they only see what is available on the ground and they, man they manage the system based on that. However, if you have forecast of what will happen into the future, even for next 10, 15 days, that will really help in, in improving the operations. So this is a new strategy. They call it as Firo. Um, maybe this is used in different parts of the world in different ways, uh, but uh, they came up with this uh, you know, nice acronym, Firo, a, a reservoir operation strategy that it better informs decisions to retain or release water. So this is very important. Uh, impending flood, so you, you make a decision whether to retain or release by integrating additional flexibility in operating policies, um, enhanced monitoring, and include weather and hydrological forecasts. We also have a problem of what we call atmospheric rivers. These are the rivers of moisture which come in uh, because of the orographic effects. And these, these moisture moisture uh, based rivers will uh, dump a tremendous amount of rainfall in different parts of the country where there is an orographic effect. And some of them do not have to be with the orographic effect, but still dump a good amount of rainfall. And that amount of rainfall is responsible for uh, extreme flooding events in different parts. For example, uh, this is in one uh, atmospheric uh, river, which is uh, coming towards California. This is uh, in 2019 in Russian River area. And you can see the amount of moisture that will be moving in in that area that will cause extreme precipitation events. So if we can predict how much water is uh, able to come towards us or how much amount of the, that particular vapor is going to be generated into a rainfall in a particular region, then we should be able to improve our operations and we can um, basically retain some of the storage uh, by operating in a better way because we, now we have better forecasts of the uh, impending uh, rainfall events. Uh, so that means instead of operating using a traditional uh, rule curve, in this case, which is shown in the orange, uh, you can actually use some kind of information about the forecast and probably you can save some water or you can retain some water at different periods of the time. So that is basically a real-time modification of your rigid rule curves based on the forecast. So this is a way how we can uh, uh, look into the FIRO adaptive water control. So you start with the climate uh, changes in the baseline conditions, climate change or regulations, and then you look into the weather uh, forecasts and then you, you evaluate the uh, operation rules. We look into the observations, and then we develop what we call the adaptive water control plan. And sometimes you can do a forecast in an adaptive way. So you start with the beginning of the system, then you go again, note what is happening uh, at the end of the time period. You update your system and then you do a reforecast again, and then you do a reforecasting. So in this case, um, as the um, length of the forecast uh, increases, of course, you'll have decrease in the confidence in that. So the idea is to introduce what we call operational changes for the short term. And for example, evaluation of uh, water levels before wet season, making space for storage for expected forecasted inflows, seasonal changes in storage levels need to be assessed. A risk assessment should be uh, done and then, of course, uh, we can use ensemble based stream flow forecasting methods so that we can come up with what we call uh, adaptive operation schedules. Now, 
one of the important things which is least considered in one of the uh, many of these models is the antecedent moisture conditions of the drainage area. This is very important that needs to be considered in every part of the simulation model. Now, how do we address or incorporate climate change? Uh, typically, what we do in any climate change study, we take an emission scenario, uh, we we plug it into a GCM, uh, and then we try to project into the future. And depending upon what we are looking at in a region, we downscale it, uh, both spatially and temporally. And then once we have the downscale projections of our essential climatic variables, we put them into a uh, we put them into either design. Uh, curves are developing, like for example, intensity, duration, frequency curves, or you can come up with some kind of uh, uh, series which we can help us to develop what we call sustainable uh, compromise hydrologic designs. So uh, GCMs, I'm sure everybody is familiar. We are basically looking at both internal and external atmospheric forcings. We look at impact studies based on uh, past and future precipitation or temperature or any other variables. Uh, the only issue is they are very coarse. Um, um, and uh, for regional studies, uh, for example, a small watershed, you need to have what we call the spatial downscaling. And once we do the downscaling, we need to have some kind of corrections to the climatic variables. So these are some of the jargon, climate models, climate scenarios, ensemble runs and downscaling. I don't want to go through this one, but we know that there are different types of models which consider different representations of the earth and land and feedback processes. We have scenarios. We also have what we call ensemble runs depending upon the initial conditions. And then we do. Here are some of the examples of uh, climate change models we use. Um, as you can see, these are developed by different uh, modeling groups and different countries. And GCMs produce uh, a large number of variables at that uh, high um, uh, resolute, uh, sorry, course resolution, and you can see that these all variables are very useful for us to uh, predict our temperature or precipitation. And you can see that uh, these are the number of variables which are produced. So basically, what we are doing is we are starting from a coarser scale to a finer scale. We are downscaling it, and that's what we are doing. So either you can do take the GCM. Uh, these are the GCM centers. You can directly downscale to a point location, or you can downscale to a grid location, or you can first downscale to a grid, and then from the grid, you can downscale to the, a point location. This is NCEF, is a National Center for Environmental Protection. We have gridded data available for that, so we can use sometimes that as an observational data. So. If you look at the predictor variables, because we need to have some variables that can help us to predict, let's say, uh, um, precipitation. So this is an example of precipitation. And these are the predictor variables which are used to predict precipitation. And you can see there are a couple of studies in India, and we have done a couple of studies in Florida and other parts of the world. And you can see that uh, some of these variables are useful in some regions and some of them are not useful and so on. So what we do is we take all the variables which are generated from GCMs and then we try to develop what we call a downscaling methodology. There are two types of downscaling, dyna dynamical and statistical. Dynamical are a little more computationally intensive. They are nested models. Um, but statistical downscaling is much easier because you have the coarser uh, climatic uh, variables from GCM uh, produced output variables. And then we try to link it to the ground variables, for example, temperature or precipitation. We can use regression. We can use any type of uh, uh, functional approximation technologies so that we can come with what we call statistical downscaling. The only problem with uh, downscaling is that uh, we make some assumptions. That assumptions are that predictors are physically meaningful. Um, they are responsible for climate variability. Uh, the one other assumption we make is that the relationship between the predictor variables and predictant is stationary. So that means we're thinking that everything will be the same as what we have seen historically. And that's not true because the relationships are also non-stationary. So we need to do some kind of uh, bias correction or at least understand that there's uncertainty associated with our projections into the future. And uh, they tend to underestimate the variability on also extreme events. 
So typically, climate change models will produce the mean of the uh, system as opposed to extreme event. In some cases, they can do better than the others. Uh, then they are very sensitive. Uh, coefficient of study may be different in future, especially if forced to predict out of sample values. So extrapolation is dangerous. And then, of course, we need to have relationships that do not contain large character, which will help us in. in. So here's a simple uh, strategy for statistical downscaling methodology. You start with GCM variables, you get the observations, you develop some functional forms, you use all these techniques. And then, then we go to take the predictor variables. We have the predictor predictant relationship established. We use that to predict for the future. But unfortunately, uh, we need to do bias corrections because none of these models will exactly produce what's happening on the ground. And also there are non-stationary issues, so we need to uh, handle that. And then once we have done that, we, what we have is the bias corrected projections. So for a case of uh, dam safety evaluation, we need to have few essential climatic variables. We need temperature, we need precipitation. So sometimes temporal disaggregation is also required. For example, daily values will not cut. Maybe we have to go to an hourly level. Then we have to do a bias correction. And, uh, and then once we do the bias correction, you apply them into a hydrological simulation model so that we can estimate the runoff from a watershed, which is draining into the reservoir. We can use either uh, a continuous simulation approach. Sometimes that is more beneficial to understand how the flood waves are evolving, or you can use a single event approaches or specific event approaches. And then finally, we have to route them through the reservoir system, and then we have to route the flows downstream, and then we need to understand what are the failure modes based on the different events, and then we calculate the inundation extents, and then finally, the risk assessments. So this is your continuous, continuous simulation model. We, we take all the rainfall data, we feed into a calibrated validated hydrologic simulation model, we get the runoff, we do the frequency analysis, we do the design discharge. Of course, this can be done for future projections also, uh, but again, the bias corrections and non-stationarity issues will still remain. Uh, the single event models are different where we take all the rainfall time series, then we do a frequency analysis, get a design rainfall, then put into a hydrologic simulation model, then we get the design discharge. So these are two types of models. So here's an example of how the results look like when we are correlating to point um, gauges. For example, we see here uh, very high correlations with the point temperature <coughs> measurements because temperature is a very smoothly varying parameter, so it's very easy to downscale um, uh, and the variability is well preserved. Whereas if you look at the precipitation, you see the correlations are very bad. Uh, this is for Florida, even though we don't have any topographical changes and so on. So you can see that the uh, the climate change models sometimes in some regions cannot resolve precipitation very well compared to temperature. Temperature is very well resolved as opposed to precipitation because of the the uh, the variability of the precipitation, the convective cells, the climate variability affecting the precipitation. So here's an example of um, how much is the spread based on different models. You can see that uh, if you are developing the depth for a return period of 25 years, and you can see that um, uh, you can see how much spread is there between uh, the different models and how much different they are from the observed value. So this indicates a dry bias. You are basically underestimating the precipitation, which needs to be corrected. Of course, this I'm showing before bias corrections. So one thing we need to recognize, which I have already indicated, uh, the limitations of the climate change models in predicting the precipitation well compared to temperature, and also the emission scenarios, the multi-model GCM projections, all of them will become your first and second order of uncertainties in your models. So there are so many issues which we need to address. The spatial scaling, the temporal scaling of your downscaling. What type of functional approximations are you using for predictor predictant relationships? How do we consider stationarity of relationships? Bias, uh, skill of the models, assessment metrics, model selection, bias corrections, and then how do we handle 
different models. Each model will generate different uh, projections into the future, and they may not align very well uh, with each other. So again, there's a lot of uncertainty. And then finally, there is also uncertainty in your hydrologic simulation. And then when you get to the point of climate change, uh, hydrological design. So we also have uncertainty when we are trying to assess dam safety in future climate. First of all, projected climate is not certain. We also have issues with watershed conditions. The land use, land cover might have changed into the future. The soil moisture levels are very important. Um, simulation models, whether it is watershed or routing models, the structure, the parameter, the stationarity of relationships is also a questionable thing. Uh, reservoir pool levels. Whenever we are simulating a reservoir condition for a climate change condition, you need to have some idea about historical reservoir pool levels so that we can do it in a probabilistic way. And spillway operations. What type of spillways are there? How they are operated? What is their reliability? And so on. And then finally, the dam conditions. How old is the dam? How uh, how is uh, when was the maintenance done? What are the issues? What are the weak spots? And then finally, the inundation models, which actually help us to understand the consequences of your flooding downstream. So here's an example of a recent study. This was published uh, very recently in 2021, and they have done a climate change scenario analysis. Um, and you can see the colors indicate either pessimistic uh, flooding risk and then uh, projected uh, scarcity risk in terms of the water availability in 2050. And you can see that different parts of the world have different scarcity levels and different, um, uh, you know, what you call uh, flooding risk levels, depending upon what area you look at. For example, this is India, and you can see that we are almost in this, uh, um, this color, and uh, that indicates that we have both uh, the risk of flooding as well as um, uh, projected scarcity. Of course, these are only some major dams, not all dams were considered. This is for the United States, and you can see that there is in the West, there seems to be more water scarcity uh, risk in 2050 as opposed to flooding risk, but on the east side and southeastern side and mid uh, Midwest a little bit, indicating that there is some risk associated with flooding. This is for the the other parts of the world, Europe and Africa. And how do we how do we model the risk? And of course, the risk is a very important component which should be understood in the concept of dam safety. So what we do is uh, we come we can do risk in a number of ways. Risk is always a product of a probability of occurrence of a particular event multiplied by the consequence. So that gives us the risk. In this case, I'm calculating the total risk on a conditional probability case. So that means probability of a risk, probability of a particular load. In this case, load means um, uh, the flood or any type of event that will cause uh, problems for the dam. And then based on that, we can see whether there will be a failure or non-failure, and we can put that in a combined equation to calculate the risk. But if you are just calculating the risk of failure to the dam break, then you'll remove the non-failure part, and then uh, you just estimate the risk of failure. But if it is non-failure, then you can include the same non-failure equation. So dam failure can be attributed to a specific event. Um, it can be flooding or earthquake or any other issue based on issue-based failure. And we consider normal, no flood or earthquake uh, scenarios hydrological scenarios, uh, seismic scenarios, or sometimes sabotage or vandalism, somebody uh, you know, blowing up the dam and so on. Um, so simultaneous occurrence of these loads are possible so that we can consider that. And then what are the consequences? The adverse efforts of the dam, uh, proof of uh, loss of life, uh, indirect and direct consequences that needs to be evaluated so that we can calculate the risk associated for the particular dam. So as you can see that we can classify the likelihood of an event as low, moderate, high and very high and consequence also low, moderate, medium and very high. And you can see that uh, when the consequence of the event is very high and the uh, and the likelihood is high, definitely it is a catastrophic event. 
So this is uh, taken by a recent spam cold um, uh, document, uh, the Spanish Commission on Large Dams, and you can see that um, how the dam safety management is being uh, conducted. You have a dam safety file based on what has been done, what are the operation rules, what are the emergency plans, and then they consider these loads. The system response, the system response is mainly the failure mechanisms and the failure probabilities, and then we consider the consequences. So once we have these three components available to us, then we can assess the risk. And the loads, failure response, and consequences can be based on the projected climate also. The only thing is we have to understand that the projected climate and the projected conditions of the watershed into the future has to be considered, and we should also acknowledge there is uncertainty in our climate change models into the future. So this is the risk analysis steps. As you can see that you have all the steps which we carry on, loads, system response, and consequences. These are very important for us. So once we have all these three components based on either projected data or current existing conditions or in, for any particular event, we can actually calculate the risk of failure and that can help us to improve our risk management. So finally, when we look into um, uh, the different components, how do we address climate change impacts? So for example, floods, we need to have different assessment methods, uncertainty, in climate uh, projections need to be addressed. Uh, water reservoir, water levels are also very important because this, this gives us the initial condition of uh, a dam with a water in it, and that is very important, and that has to be based on historical, uh, historical uh, data. But of course, climate change will have impact on those water levels, and we have to use climate change projections, downscaling techniques, and then uh, we have to see how we can model that when we are trying to assess the reservoir levels. We also have gate performance, the flood routing strategy, and the failure modes. For example, you see that in failure modes, the glacier melt, slope stability, glacier lake outburst floods, and one of those we have seen, especially the ice jam floods and so on. So obviously, every part of the uh, component of the dam, uh, both modeling component, the structural component, the actual physical component, um, which we have discussed in terms of spillways, the gate performance, everything needs to be assessed uh, from a climate change perspective. And also there are assessment methods for each of them so that we can assess and improve our uh, re risk reduction management capabilities. Um, and then, of course, we have the socioeconomic uh, consequences. When I say <clears throat> this, this one is both direct and indirect, depending upon how a flood will affect us. And those consequences will need to be equated, in, included in the risk equation. And once we have that, we can start looking at the, uh, the overall risk for a particular failure of a dam. Um, so obviously, when we are looking into future, we, we can assess the risk of a dam failure or uh, operational failure. When we are looking at short term, we can look at how we can improve the short term operations, given that we have a reliable forecast into the future, either 15 days or a seasonal forecast, so that we can start improving our operations by not releasing too much water or by not retaining too much water. So we are giving that cushion of safety for our reservoir operations. Uh, so what are the plans for future, especially for hydropower? Uh, these are some of the things which are um, promoted in different parts of the world. United States is also taking care of that. Uh, what we are looking at is a pumped storage hydropower plant where we create another upper reservoir and we have a turbine and a pump which is being um, uh, acting in a dual purpose. So both of them, um, and sometimes it is producing the power. In some cases, it is pumping the water back into the upper reservoir there. So it's kind of an open loop. And this is how the purpose, dual purpose works. And uh, we do have right now 42 um, pump storage plants, and there is a, a lot of push for increasing that into the future so that these can be very reliable. So we, uh, very um, not prone to that climate change effects in terms of droughts and all. So we have more reliable water supply. Now you might ask, uh, of course you are using 
electricity to generate, uh, sorry, to use the pump to pump the water up. You no, know, sometimes we use what we call the solar power uh, to use that. And also the price management, whenever the energy prices are lower, at that time you would pump the water back into the up, up, upstream reservoir and then produce power when the prices are up. So it can be managed in that way. So finally, to conclude, uh, there are some recommendations uh, which we can follow. Uh, Long-term water resources management is very important. Of course, we need to look into climate change projections. Uh, downscaling procedures are very critical. And of course, the possible climate change scenarios. Short-term operations can be carried out by what we call forecast-informed operations. Uh, it all depends on seasonal forecast and also incorporation of climate variability, for example, El Nino, La Nina cycles and so on, so that we can improve the seasonal forecasting so that we can come to what we call climate change sensitive sustainable operating policies. Um, some of the other recommendations are we need to uh, be we need to even forecast the temporal lengths of the these oscillations, for example, how long El Nino will last, how long La Nina will last. So that will also help. And we should also do what we call adaptive operations, which we have already discussed. Um, and then, of course, whenever we are using management, there should be trade off between long term and short term and compromise climate change operating policies should be uh, should be uh, developed. And uh, also uh, you cannot just manage hydro systems based on single or multiple objectives, but we should consider the, uh, the connections between multiple sectors that are impacted by climate change. Uh, we need to understand uncertainties. We need to also assess what we call resiliency, reliability, and vulnerability of the systems. Um, and then uh, we need to develop what we call the level of service. So this is what we are doing right now in United States for every system, uh, every levy, every discharging system, every dam, we are looking at what we call the level of service. So we can say that how much service this particular hydrologic structure is able to offer us depending upon the climate change conditions. For example, if you are looking at a coastal area, you are looking at sea level rise issues also where we are not able to release the water into the coastal areas. And of course, we need to also look into low flow improvements, sediment management, the restoration of downstream um, to mimic natural flows. This is the natural flow restoration. And uh, we already talked about Firo. And then uh, looking at the AR6 recommendations, we have to see that we need to go back and reevaluate our design standards so that we can improve our um, inputs to our hydrologic simulation models. And once we do that, we can have more better assessment of the risk associated with our <coughs> dams. So uh, some of the ideas which are being floated by different institutes, for example, this is the Stanford Wood Institute for Environment, rehabilitate, retrofit, and remove. As you can see, they are self-explanatory um, uh, terms. Um, then also they are looking into development of hydropower technologies uh, to improve generation efficiency, um, environmental performance, and wind generation, excuse along me, with uh, yeah. Excuse me, sir. With all due respect, uh, I would I'm like done. to say we have a slight. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so done. much. Sorry. I'm done. Sorry. Um, so now I call also made some recommendations in terms of how to control the. Uh, methane emissions. This is a welcome statement from uh, my code, and uh, you can see that where they are suggesting where the uh, water intake structure should be included. And there are a lot of documents which are available, which you can refer to where there's a tremendous amount of effort being done to incorporate climate change into our design process, both at United States and outside of the world. And there are some publications, and these are some of my works, which address climate change, uh, both downscaling, climate variability, statistical analysis, water resources management, and so on. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Viraj Loniana from FAMS, and then in cold, I cold, and all other uh, um, researchers who contributed to this particular presentation through images and uh, um, all kinds of uh, input. And I'd like to thank all of them. Thank you so much for your attention. I apologize for going about your time limit.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. Uh, and uh, I think uh, your presentation is really useful for a design project and mostly from my point of view uh, for the operators who deals with uh, the management of existing dams under climate change uh, um, evolutions. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, well, uh, now uh, I would like to uh, uh, moving to move directly to, to the closing remarks uh, from uh, Mr. Uh, uh, D.K. Sharma, uh, the vice president, uh, I call them president uh, of uh, INCOLT. So uh, the floor is here for the closing remarks. Sharma sir, are you here? Uh, I'll just check. I don't think I, I can't see him. Okay. Maybe. So no. we move to uh, Matei. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Matei, yeah, for the closing remarks of this uh, presentation. Okay, I will be sure. Uh, I would say thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting and quite a hot spot topic right now, I would say. And I will also use this opportunity to say thank you to the team calls who uh, provided the support for this webinar and for Mr. Dino who attended on our season holiday, if I understand correctly. Thank you for showing us the support. Uh, and thank you for moderating this webinar. Uh, there will be more to come, so follow our work. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mateya. Thank you, Julia. And I would like to uh, thank our honored guest, Dr. Professor Ramesh. Thank you so much for this elaborate presentation. And for all the questions uh, in the text box, uh, we would write to you everybody uh, what are your questions and we'll answer them and for the ppts do write your email ids in the text box we'll I love to email all the presentations to all of you uh, if anybody have else to say or we can just wrap this presentation yep so Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, President uh, Mr. Lino, for coming. Matea, Julia, Ramesha, and everybody else joining us from India and abroad. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I would request our in call uh, YPG people to stay and I called as well, just for a couple of minutes. Thank you so much, all. And if there's any, if there are any questions, please send me an email or I can be contacted. You can look up on website uh, on Google. You can look at for my email and I'll be happy to send you a response. I'm sure you'll be flooded with questions. Sir. We'll ensure you'll get enough. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, sir. Just a word before leaving. Yeah, sir. Uh, we clearly understand that uh, climate change is bad news for for dams. I just hope that we can prove maybe that dams are good news for mitigation uh, climate change effects uh, in, in the future. We have to prove that. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Sir.